I could never sleep well in hotels. I guess that's somewhat of an understatement. I can never sleep well in general, but hotels were the worst. Just the thought that the previous occupant of this bed is a complete stranger was repulsive in my mind. But that's beside the point. What I'm getting at is how this lack of sleep in hotels changed my life. Christmas. We were spending Christmas in a terrible hotel and not with family. Great. Don't get me wrong, it's not like I didn't enjoy the all you can eat buffet of soggy hash browns and grits for Christmas Eve dinner. Of course, the first snow of the season had to cancel our flight down to Virginia. It was Christmas Eve and I was trying to sleep in this bleach saturated room, my mind wondering. Wondering? What happened in here to cause such an excessive amount of bleach needed? The room was nothing out of the ordinary. Two beds, one for me and my dad and another for my sister and mom. A bathroom and a stained microwave that looked in need of a good dusting. Somehow, I escaped the room and stench of bleach into a dreamless sleep. Waking up, I could tell it was early morning. My dad was next to me, snoring, and he usually wakes up before 4am. That's when it hit me. It's Christmas. And I was about to let this bad fortune ruin my favourite holiday. Looking across the bed at the clock to check the time is when I noticed it. The silhouette of a man about 6'3", across the room staring at my mum's sleep. Still half asleep and caught up in the moment, I couldn't help thinking of Santa Claus. I realised how stupid the thought was, and horror soon filled my head. I choked back a screech. I knew I couldn't let him see me awake, so I quietly put my head back down, pretending to sleep. My mind was racing. Someone was in my room, and I couldn't do anything. I was a scrawny 16 year old, and this man looked built like an ox. I wondered if I could wake my dad up in time, but I knew that wouldn't work. He slept like a rock, a bucket of water couldn't get him up fast enough. I was practically in tears. I'd never felt so helpless. For a second time, I choked back a scream. He was standing next to me. I could feel and hear his repulsive breath on my face. It smelled like he'd been eating rotten meat for a week now with no thought to brush his teeth. If he didn't know I was awake, surely he did now. Seeing my face was contorted in fear. The breathing stopped and I couldn't help the sigh of relief. I would have kicked myself but there was no need. I heard the room door open and close. I launched out of bed. Nothing in the room was disarray. Nothing in the room was in disarray and my family was still asleep. That couldn't have been a dream. I couldn't have imagined it. Feeling awake as ever, a horrible idea popped into my head and before I could push it away, I was pulling the door open. Glancing back to the door in order to memorize the room number, I saw the giant spray painted black X on the door. Had I seen this without the prior experience, I probably would have thought it was just some stupid kids. I knew better but not enough to know what it was for. My heart skipped a beat. There he was, turning the corner at the end of the hall. Why am I doing this? I thought to myself. I tailed him down to the parking lot. He was nowhere in sight. One moment he's walking out to the lobby, the next he's gone. Realizing how cold it is outside in paper-thin pajamas, 
I returned to the lobby. No one was around. Strange. I could swear there's usually a night concierge. Adrenaline wearing off, I realized how stupid and rash my actions had been. He could have killed me. I cursed myself back up the stairs. I knew something was wrong when I got to my floor. The door to my room was wide open. I hadn't left it that way, right? I walked inside and after a quick search of the room I determined it safe and my family was still asleep. I locked the door and got back into bed, though I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. I listened to my dad get up and eventually my mom followed but I still pretended to sleep. A few hours passed and my parents got my sister and I up. We got into the car and made our way back to the airport. Digging through my bag to grab my iPod led to the finding of something that hadn't been there in the previous day. A note that simply held the five words I still think about to this day. I knew you were awake. It's now been two months since the hotel experience. I'm still scared for my life and it gets worse every day. That note I found wasn't the only one. I still receive them. He first suspected that they were going to eat him when he noticed the distinct lack of yuletide smells. It wasn't perhaps a conscious thought, at least not one which had been fully realised, but there was a clear growing uneasiness within him. Somehow, he just knew. Surely if a family invited you for Christmas dinner, the house would be filled with the wonderful aromas associated with that annual feast. Succulent roast turkey, honey glazed vegetables, perhaps the fumes of mulled wine or brandy covered Christmas pudding. But no, all of these were absent. Yet the table was set. It was a particularly bleak Christmas, and while snow was often welcome at that festive time of year, the penetrating cold and frost which seemed to sabotage both homes and the residents' bodies was not. The temperature had plummeted on the 7th, and there had been little sign of any forthcoming reprieve. Families attempted as best as they could to reach one another, but for many, it was to be a lonely Christmas day. Travel, especially for the elderly, was almost impossible for fear of slipping on the ice. One fall was all it would take for a broken hip or shoulder, and for the more fragile individuals amongst them, recovering from such an injury was not an easy task. Certainly not as easy as it would be for those of a younger vintage. The Cardinal family had taken pity on an elderly gentleman who had recently moved into the neighbourhood only a few streets away. They were part of an upstanding stock, and took part in a local home help initiative spending time with the old and vulnerable. Everyone knew and loved them. Timmy was the youngest, a boy of only five or six. He was a child whom all looked upon with great adoration. Never complaining, never causing trouble, always adorable. And his ten-year-old sister, Camilla, was equally as admired. They were both a testament to the caring and nurturing parental skills of Ben and Lucy Cardinal. Each year, as the cold winter drew in, the Cardinal family were admired for their dedication and commitment to those around them. Their passion, almost zeal for helping those who were less fortunate. But behind the smiles and the skin-deep facade, of that of a loving family, 
loads of far more sinister purpose. They had a tradition each year, a way to reward themselves for their kindness and generosity, one which stemmed back through many previous generations of the Cardinal family. Each Christmas, they would invite a guest for dinner, who would be welcomed with open arms to their home, sat down at a beautifully set table, provided with humorous and enjoyable Christmas conversation, and then, by the light of the roaring fire, the guest would be stabbed to death and eaten gratefully. They all reveled in the old tradition, with Timmy looking forward to it the most. He had a ferocious appetite and a waistline to match it. But children do get so wrapped up in the anticipation of a family Christmas, and his parents were delighted to see a growing boy fill his belly. Camilla was a more quiet disposition than her stout little brother, slight with a figure with a pallid complexion, which reminded all of her mother. But make no mistake, she adored eating with the family, and could render anyone silent with a sharp, cold insult. Ben was the local police chief for the area, so covering up their annual feast was quite the clinch. While Lucy was, shall we say, a relation of sorts, and was entirely enthusiastic about maintaining the Christmas tradition. Their guests were, invariably, those without family, and often of a ripe old age, forgotten by society, left to wither in their isolated little houses. Ben explained to the children yearly that it was almost a kindness to put the victims out of their slowly increasing misery. And besides, when they did eventually die, they would be shoved into a box in the ground or roasted into ashes. What a waste of good meat. This year, Timmy and Camilla were especially excited. It was all their mother could do to calm their nerves, but on that Christmas Eve, it was nearly impossible, for they knew the special treat they were in for the following day. The Cardinals were hosting a most special guest. His name was Sergio Muraru, and he hailed from Eastern Europe. They had never had foreign meat before, and the very idea of tearing into some delicious, exotic muscle and fat made this year's feast something to really look forward to. They had met Old Man Muraru just a few weeks earlier on when Ben had noticed the usual name on this home help list. Each year as Christmas approached, the volunteers at the local church would be given names and addresses of pensioners in the area who had no family and would be left quite alone over the holiday season. At that festive time of year, and worried that many of their frailer residents might succumb to the biting cold, church committee members would visit each of these lonely individuals and offer a friendly ear, a helping hand, and often some hearty food to the poorest of those on the list. The names would rarely change but at least one person on that list would sadly pass away that year. Being an upstanding member of the community and a high-ranking police officer in the area, Ben would often inform the church that one of their flock had sadly passed away. And with no friends or family known, he would connect a lie which usually involved a long-lost son or daughter appearing to take their sadly departed parents somewhere far away to be buried. That, or he would say that they had simply moved, having a bit of a deal with a local estate agent and solicitor's firm to throw the proceeds from any property sales their way. The family were not without influence. It was incredible how little people questioned this, but as the Cardinals ensured that each Christmas meal was not an active member in their church or community, People just assumed that Ben knew best. This year, the Cardinals had been hoping to invite Lucy Rindridge around for a Christmas swan song, but unfortunately, she had died during the summer. Ben had investigated and he suspected that 
an intruder had been inside the house with her at the time of her death, but it seemed as though the causes were natural. No, the family would just have to have someone different for dinner. Then the name appeared on the list. Sergio Moraru, 86, slight emphysema, no family, knows no one in the area as he has only recently moved here. Perfect. Ben found Mr. Moraro to be an absolute delight. Bolly was obviously very frail, his mind was still sharpened, and he regaled Ben with numerous colourful stories about the old country and the adventures he had while in the full bloom of youth. Of particular interest were his war stories, and Ben was thrilled to know that their main course would be that of an intelligent, well-travelled man. He even looked unlike any of the other previous victims. He was quite tall, although slightly hunched with age, and with a long crooked nose and intense stare, Ben fancied that, in his youth, Muraru would have been quite intimidating. His kind smile and obvious fragile frame, however, left Ben in no doubt that the kids would love him. They enjoyed eating those with character and a gentle disposition. He always enjoyed the meat more if it had a keen mind and was out of the ordinary, as the family religion, one which had managed to stay unseen yet influential throughout the centuries, stated that the eating of another human being would transmit some of its strengths to those whom devoured it, and with many of those who can only look into the past rather than see into the future, Sergio Moraru enjoyed the company greatly, and was touched when Ben invited him to sit at his family's Christmas table. The old man was extremely frail, and required the assistance of both Ben and Camilla to help him in and out of Ben's car, and then into the house. His emphysema was particularly bad that day, as each step was accompanied by the wheezing, fluid-filled sounds of struggling lungs. Each room of the Cardinal home was draped in a multicoloured selection of rather crass Christmas decorations, with numerous cards adorning every visible table and mantelpiece, showcasing just how popular Ben and his family really were. The table was beautifully laid, with a red cotton cloth resting underneath an elegant cream dining set. The old man found that the rest of Ben's family were just as pleasant and congenial as he was. Timmy and Camilla were kind and very well behaved for their age, helping the frail old man to his chair carefully and then waiting on him, topping up his drink as their mother and father busied themselves in the kitchen. Finally, Lucy appeared, carrying a huge centerpiece plate. It was unusually large as she sat it in the middle of the table. Empty and devoid of food, old man Moraru caught a look on Lucy's face. It was brief, and he immediately attempted to disregard it as a product of his imagination, but it unsettled him deeply. It was as if a private joke had been passed between the eyes of Lucy and her children, a flicker of a grin, and not one of kindness or of Christmas spirit, but rather one resembling that of a conspiratorial bully. As if Sergio was some unwitting recipient of some unwholesome prank, waiting to be ridiculed. Just as the unease began to diminish, Ben appeared with a large, jagged carving knife, and a long, two-pronged fork which reminded Sergio more of a butcher's implement than that required to cut a decent-sized turkey. A turkey which became increasingly conspicuous by its absence. There, they sat for over an hour, each member of the Cardinal family replenishing the old man's drink with enthusiasm and showing concern for every and each cough or moment of uncomfortable breathing 
experienced by their guest. But it was a strange concern. There, they sat gleefully, asking Moraro questions and listening to the stories and answers which came about his life. Where he had lived, how many battles he had fought in. But the interest and concern seemed to be distant somehow. It was only skin deep. Each time their guest mentioned the old country, those same conspiracy-laden glances were traded across the table, as if excited, not by the content of the stories, but rather by the simple facts that Muraru was a foreigner. The absence of not only food, but that of the mere mention of it was unsettling enough. But what was more perplexing was that Ben repeatedly stole looks towards an antique clock which sat on the mantelpiece above the fire. Looks which were poorly hidden and betrayed their purpose. He was counting down the minutes to some event. While the old man had no idea what that event was, the certainty was apparent that it was not connected to anything cooking in the kitchen. Moraro knew that there was simply no food being roasted, grilled, or even cooled on a window ledge nearby. Whatever was being planned, it was not going to involve him eating a Christmas meal. It was Camilla who stopped smiling first at his anecdotes and historical observations. She had ceased listening. No longer was she politely laughing at obnoxious jokes and the endearing sight of an old man repeating himself through forgetfulness. Camilla was simply staring. Staring with those pinpoint, cold, dark eyes. As a snake before a strike. Timmy was next to abandon the act as he began to grin menacingly at Sergio, as his hands gripped a small, serrated steak knife intensely. The most alarming thing was that the focus of Timmy's stare was not of the old man's face, but his wrinkled neck. With one last glance at the clock, Ben ceased being the jovial, attentive host and began to run his fingers along the huge carving knife in front of him, with a mixture of anger and lust upon his face. Sergio had seen many things in his time, but nothing as surprisingly strange and unnerving as this. Finally, when the clock began to chime, Lucy relinquished her false, endearing shell and exposed the cold-hearted and twisted personality which lay beneath. As the chimes slowly rang throughout the house, one by one, echoing and lonely and piercing in their symbolism, each of the cardinals rose up from their chairs, sharp, jagged knives in hand, and waited. The chime rang once, and they uttered an indecipherable phrase in unison. The chime rang twice, and they increased their cult-like chorus in ferocity and volume. The chime rang three times, and then they stopped. All was silent. The house was devoid of sound, Christmas spirit, and that of hope. The old man's wheezing grew in intensity as the uniquely bizarre sight of the twisted family about to dine dawned upon Sergio. The family then quietly and efficiently walked around the dining table and stood motionless surrounding the guest. Just as the old man was about to inquire what was to become of him, the clock on the mantelpiece burst into life one final time. The chime was different from the others. It was sharper, somehow fouler, and echoed once and once only throughout the cardinal home. From behind, Lucy slit the old man's throat from ear to ear 
as Ben thrust his carving knife deep into Sergio's stomach. Both parents then removed their knives and stood back, watching with pride as Camilla cut and stabbed repeatedly, while Timmy thrust his steak knife in and out of Moraru's legs, neck and arms. After a few minutes, the frenzy diminished as both children grew tired, and with one last downward thrust, Timmy drove his steak knife so deeply into the old man's hand that it skewered it completely, embedding itself into the table on which the hand rested. The children now ran to their parents' collective embrace. They hugged and rejoiced in what was a fantastic Christmas game, and now could look forward with delight to some succulent, exotic meat. Arms wrapped around one another, they stared at their victim and began to laugh loudly, commenting on the old fool's stories of times gone by, the war and the old country. As they turned to each other once more, the laughter diminished and they looked into each other's rosy, blood-covered faces and shared a family moment. This had been one of Ben's favourite sacrifices. But the laughter had not completely ceased. One person was still laughing loudly. Confusion turned to abject horror as the bizarre truth revealed itself. It was Mr. Moraru. Sitting, covered in blood, his head tilted back, and the deep cut in his throat wide open. The dinner guest laughed loud and strong, a laugh which was both young and old. His head arced forward as he pulled Timmy's steak knife out of his hand, dropping it on the floor. Camilla screamed as Lucy hid behind Ben. What they thought to be a corpse now stared at them all as they all had stared at it with a singular purpose. Timmy began to pee himself and cry as two previously retracted fangs cracked through the old man's upper gum, revealing a serrated and terrifying grin. As he rose to his feet, Lucy fainted, and with both hunch and age now gone, the Cardinal's guest loomed tall and dark before them, his eyes piercing, telling tales of countries and decades and of centuries of existence. Sergio Muraru ate well that Christmas. Patrick Finn arrived home from his Christmas conquests, beating out the snowstorm by mere miles, mere minutes. He felt not only the foreboding presence of a hazardous blizzard, but also that of something else, something darker. It felt as if it resonated not only within his soul, but also within the souls of those around him, within the very ground itself. Patrick had never bothered to check, but he was sure that beneath the grass and soil of Winter Harbour, Maine, therein hungered a gaping mouth, or a chasm yearning for the flesh of the innocent, and anchored to the physical world only by a desire to seem normal. It had not yet been appeased because the residents of Winter Harbour were all but innocent. Patrick had moved to Winter Harbour, hoping to escape the despondency and despair he had felt in his hometown, Belmont, Maine. So far, these feelings had only amplified, magnified, by both the wintry death that he felt tiptoeing in the town's midst and the lingering scent of paint that seemed to permeate every building in the city. It was as if the town was 
constantly being repainted in some sort of half-hearted attempt to cover something up. Still, he felt it necessary to stay, so as to not make matters worse for his wife, whom he barely saw anymore, and his son, who always seemed so distant. He and his wife were going through a rife time in their marriage, and the son was feeling its effects. It was akin to what one may feel after a tumultuous earthquake. Patrick felt that he had to make it up to his son, so he went out and bought him the most expensive and extravagant thing he could get his hands on this late in the shopping season, a brand new video game system. He had assured his son that, even though he had acted out often this year, Santa would bring him something good. Throughout these charades, Patrick felt empty at the prospect of shopping for a boy that he knew nothing about. A boy whose existence was forgotten every so often. On the eve of Christmas, Patrick arrived home before the snowstorm and quickly crept into the garage to wrap the present and place it under the tree. It was in the garage that he often felt abrupt changes as if, within its small space, it contained secrets beyond human comprehension. The musky smell of the old holiday decorations, cobbled with the omnipresent scent of fresh paint, varnish, and gasoline, all seemed to meld into one personified force, whispering sweet nothings to Patrick as he exited his car. This caused him to shudder heavily, as if beset by a fit of delirium tremens. He shrugged off the dull headaches and dry mouth before quickly and sloppily wrapping the gift. Following this, he slipped it under the tree and began to creep upstairs. He couldn't help but grimace at the thought that he was as far from Santa as humanly possible. As he reached the top of the landing, Patrick glanced over at the clock. It read 11.49. He stood there, as if to wait for some fleeting childhood feeling that may accompany the arrival of Christmas. It did not come, as he soon found out. Nor did the cheery music, nor the scent of evergreens and cookies. Just deafening silence and that damnable scent of paint. It was everywhere. He couldn't escape it. The arrival of yet another disappointing Christmas struck Patrick like a blow to the face. He fell to his knees, then, subsequently, onto his stomach. He couldn't tell if he had passed out or not. Suddenly, a loud sound in his son's room jarred Patrick awake. He quickly got up and stumbled into the room. The popping sound he had heard made him wonder what made it, and when he finally found out, he was confused even further. A large, black humanoid, adorned with goat horns and a tongue that writhed like a snake, stood before him, clutching his son. Patrick stood, dumbfounded, seemingly incapable of recognising not only the creature, but anything else before him. What do you want? Patrick asked. Innately, he knew that the creature wanted something. The creature smiled, licking his lips. Thine tender fruit, not spoiled by the worms of new, but by the tree that bore it ripened not into ambrosia, but a rotten, hollow core. Patrick stared at the creature. Sweat began to collect on his brow. He felt as if his brain itself had been lit afire. He couldn't breathe. I... I can't say I understand. Patrick stammered out. The creature smiled again, 
Not by love of a dying star can a planet be adorned, but by the eruption of its most sacred peaks. I desire the treasure from which you hope to find salvation, the gift to your boy. It is a gift for me now. Patrick couldn't understand why the creature would want the game system, but he felt it necessary to give it up. He quickly bolted downstairs, grabbing the box and clutching it tight. He sprinted back up to his son's room. The creature, upon arrival, thrust Patrick's son onto the floor and held out one long, beckoning hand. As Patrick handed over the present, he couldn't help but feel as if he were Faust himself, exchanging an eternity for one single moment of gratification. The creature licked his lips once more and disappeared in the time it took Patrick to blink. When he was sure he was alone, Patrick fell to his knees and wrapped his arms around his son. He expected a thank you and I love you or something. He heard nothing. He looked down. He found that his son was withering away, becoming the very shadows that inhabited the night around him. Patrick knew at that moment that he was entirely alone, swallowed finally by the chasm beneath his feet. He stumbled into the garage before sitting down, embracing his solitude and his communion with the musky smell of paint that seemed to beckon invitingly.